Okay, this is our next bit of review. Um, this time we're going to be talking about simple harmonic motion, which, as we know, is anything but simple. <clears throat> so, the first cases that we deal with for simple harmonic motion, and this is going to sort of set the stage for everything, uh, is the horizontal spring. But before we get into that, we're going to experience simple harmonic motion any time we have um, a restoring force. Uh, this is a force that brings the object back to equilibrium. So, looking at a horizontal spring, terrible drawing, you'll get over it. We have a spring attached to a mass m. The spring has a constant k. And we know that if we displace this any distance x, the force acting on the thing, in fact, all of the forces acting on the thing, is going to be negative k times x. This is simple harmonic motion in its most simple function. It's negative kx because the force is going to pull it back in to the equilibrium position. This is what's going to set up our simple harmonic motion condition. We're going to do another differential equation here. Uh, but this time it's the second derivative. Acceleration is the second derivative of x with respect to time. We could also say that it's x double prime. I won't be using that notation though. <coughs> So, substituting this in, we get mass times the second derivative of our position with respect to time is equal to negative kx. And just finishing it up, d squared x over dt squared is equal to negative k over m times x. Now, the way this works This is a problem with a known solution. I'm going to write that over here. The solution to this problem is x equals the amplitude of our motion times the cosine of omega times time, where omega is the um, angular velocity of the thing. Because it's cosine, that's going to put everything in the right units. But what's really important for us is that omega has a relationship with the period of oscillation. T is equal to 2 pi over omega, um, or the frequency of oscillation is equal to omega over 2 pi. This is where this omega is important. This is not the same as, as a wheel rolling along the ground having an angular velocity. It's a different kind of angular velocity. It just tells me about the oscillation back and forth. <clears throat> now the reason this x equals a cosine omega t is a solution is because when I take the derivative once x is now negative omega times a times sine of omega t x prime sorry and when I take it twice it's negative omega squared a cosine omega t <clears throat> and when we plug this in over here, my second derivative is negative omega squared a cosine omega t, and that's equal to negative k over m times a cosine omega t. <clears throat> the a cosine omega t on each side crosses out, the negative sign goes away, and this becomes a solution when omega squared is equal to k over n. Well this tells us something very important about our simple harmonic motion condition. For our simple harmonic motion condition, 
we have to have the second derivative of any quantity, we're just going to use x, with respect to time equal to negative something times that same variable. And that something will always be omega squared. The same omega squared that we can plug into this to find the period of oscillation. So in this case, the period of oscillation is 2 pi on the square root of m over k, which is what we see on our formula chart for simple harmonic motion. This is not the only time that we see simple harmonic motion with springs, though. We also do vertical springs. These are trickier. <clears throat> the two places you're going to see this on the AP test, or the two things that it's going to look like, is a coiled spring sitting on the ground, unstretched. We have a mass that we place on top of it and drop it. In the other place is a spring hanging from a ceiling, unstretched, and we place a mass on top of it. Now the first thing that we have to do, and it works the same in both cases, is find the equilibrium position, which is where the net force is equal to zero. In each case, the sum of my forces is going to equal zero, and we see that we've got mg pulling down on the object and kx working in the opposite direction. So that's going to tell me that mg is equal to kx, and my equilibrium position x is going to be mg over k. So that's going to be our equilibrium position. We'll just do it for this one. It's going to stretch out a little bit. This is our equilibrium position. Force equals zero. But if we were to drop this object, it would move beyond that down to the point of, in the vertical springs case, uh, maximum stretch, and in the, um, the coiled spring sitting down, the place of maximum compression. <clears throat> now the simple harmonic motion part to this is just what we did before. And so the period is always equal to 2 pi on the square root of m over k. So it doesn't depend on any of this stuff. The hard part comes when we start asking about the amplitude of oscillation. Well, if this is the lowest point, this is my highest point, and this is equilibrium, then whatever distance we found here is the amplitude of my oscillation, which is mg over k. <clears throat> so that tells me some important stuff. The point of maximum compression is mg over k below equilibrium, or it's going to be twice that, 2mg over k, below the unstretched or uncompressed length. <clears throat> Once it's right compressed. At the equilibrium position, we're going as fast as we can possibly go. It's easier once these problems get going to start referencing things at the equilibrium position and to stop thinking about gravity. Now comes the hard part. Pendulums. So, <clears throat> we're going to look at the hard case first. We're going to look at physical pendulums. Physical pendulums <clears throat> are probably, I would say, my students' least favorite part of the mechanics test, year in and year out, without exception. So for a physical pendulum, we have sort of a hinge on a wall. I'm just going to do a bar. But it's an uneven bar, mostly because I can't draw. <clears throat> the properties of the bar are as follows. It has length L, moment of inertia I, and the center of mass is below the point of rotation, a distance of X. Now, <clears throat> all potential energy
will be measured at the, scene, the center of mass. So all the potential energy is taken for the center of mass and all kinetic energy for this bar is rotational, so one half I omega squared. If you're going to try to find maximum speeds or maximum angles, those two things are going to get you there. Now, as far as the simple harmonic motion part goes, what we're doing is imagining that we have taken this, and we have swung it out to this angle theta, assuming that it is a small angle. That's important, so let's write it. A small angle. When that happens, we've displaced our center of mass. Now, we know that gravity still pulls straight down on the center of mass. That's mg pulling straight down, but that's not the restoring force. That's not what's bringing it back to its equilibrium position. The part of mg that's bringing it back to the equilibrium position is that one, mg sine of theta. And it's bringing it back to this point here. Since we're talking about an object's moment of inertia, and we're talking about the perpendicular part of its force, we're really talking about torques. The sum of my torques in this case is I, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration, and that's equal to the torque, negative mg sine of theta, times the distance which that torque is applied at. <clears throat> which is x. Now, because we're using a small angle, we can use the small angle approximation, which says that for small angles, sine of theta is roughly equal to theta in radians. Since we think in radians here, it's not a problem. So I can rewrite this. I alpha is equal to negative mgx times theta, which gives me alpha equals negative mgx over i times theta. But if we remember that alpha is the second derivative of position with respect to time, we have negative mg x over i times theta is equal to the second derivative of theta. This is our SHM condition, which tells us that this right here is omega squared, so that we can say our period is equal to 2 pi on the square root of i over m. Anytime we get a function to look like this, we can use the simple harmonic motion condition. We can say that this is going to be true about its period. We can say that theta as a function of time is equal to theta zero, the amplitude, times cosine of omega t, where again, that's omega squared. We can say all of the things about this physical pendulum now that we said about the spring. And we already know how to take care of the energy conditions, which are going to tell me more information about the velocity. This is the hard pendulum. Simple pendulums are simple. Pretty straightforward because there are not as many variables to deal with. For a simple pendulum, We have a ceiling, a string, and a mass at the end of this string. What's great about this is that the length L and the distance to the center of mass are one and the same. What's also nice about this is that the center of mass is where the mass is, so gravitational potential energy just has to do with the position of mass, so UG depends on the mass 
the position of the mass and my energy, my kinetic energy, is equal to one half mv squared. We don't have to um, look at energy in terms of rotation, though if you did one half i omega squared, if you plug things into that, that's one half i for a mass rotating a distance of l away from the center is just m l squared times omega squared which is v over r or, or in this case v squared over l squared well that just reduces to one half m v squared so even if you make the mistake of trying to use rotational kinetic energy it should if you're doing it right if you're doing it right, reduce to um, standard kinetic energy. Now, back to what we do when this thing becomes a pendulum. Let's say we rotate this some small angle theta. And again, it's a small angle. Well, we have mg pulling straight down. We're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the mg sine theta part of it. So I alpha here is going to be equal to negative mg sine theta and this time it's going to be times L not X so we get alpha is equal to negative mg L over I times theta so omega squared is equal to mg L over I we've already said this the I is equal to ml squared, the m's cross out, one of my l's goes away, and omega squared is equal to uh, g over l, which means that the period is 2 pi on the square root of l over g, which is on our formula chart, which is how we find the period of a pendulum. The simple harmonic motion condition works for anything that can be fit this way. Uh, last year on the AP test, you were given, not you, the kids that took the AP Physics C test, were given a um, torsion pendulum, and, and they were told that the torque acting on the thing depended on um, restoring, uh, I'm sorry, a force that went like negative K omega. I'm sorry, negative k theta. So I alpha equaled negative k times theta. Alpha equaled negative k over I times theta. And guess what? We're already back to that being omega squared and this being our period. This being omega squared and our period, in this case, being equal to 2 pi on the square root of I over whatever that k was. We could go, go on with the rest of the problem.